Hi, I'm David Early, and I am one of the founding principals of PlaceWorks, the founder of our Northern California office. I'm also the author of the Solano Press book called The General Plan in California, and I'm an emeritus member of the California Planning Roundtable, a group of professional planners who works across the state to enhance the planning practice in our state. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the planning framework, um, what the legal basis is for flat planning, and some of the specifics of state planning law. Uh, let's start by talking about the history of planning in California and the country and some of the key milestones in planning. Um, planning in this country arose out of um, what was um, sometimes called the good government movement in the late 19th century, the end of the 1800s, in which, as you see in some of these photos, there were really pretty terrible conditions in many of our cities. Um, particularly because we had industrial uses very close to housing uses, and we also had people living in unsanitary conditions in a variety of different types of buildings. And because of those conditions, people started talking about separating uses one from another to make for better conditions, and they also talked about trying to create regulations that would affect the ways that people would conduct specific uses. And that went through a number of different types of zoning. Um, we had the beginnings of zoning in both the city of New York and the city of Los Angeles um, in the early part of the 20th century, to the point where um, the federal government passed the Standard City as Planning Enabling Act in 1928. Um, California started requiring that every city and county have a master plan in 1927, and by the 1970s, you had both the National Environmental Policy Act as well as the California Environmental Quality Act. So why do we do this planning? Well, we're trying to establish goals and policies for directing and managing future growth and development so that our communities can thrive in ways that are safe and healthy for all of its residents and users. We're wanting to address fundamental issues like the location of growth, housing needs, environmental protection, making sure that people are safe and healthy within their communities. Um, and resources are always limited. So planning helps us to account for future demand for services, including sewers, roads, and fire protection to make sure that we're planning for each of those services as development occurs. So who is it who does planning? Well, actually, all of us do planning. All of us do things, you know, we, we wake up every morning, we plan our day. Um, some of us may have planned a kitchen remodel or um, added a room to our house. We've planned college for our children. Um, we do a lot of different kinds of planning. And even in our even physical planning, we, are, we might lay out a garden, we might make a home addition. So all of us are planners in some way or another. But at the government level, planning is done in the state of California at the city and county level. Um, we have a set of principles, particularly in California, that just, just dictate local control, that local cities and counties get to decide about the, the planning decisions they make. But they are supported by regional and state agencies. These include the State Department of Housing and Community Development, who is sponsoring these, this slideshow. Um, it also includes the regional planning bodies like SCAG, the Southern California Association of Governments in Southern California, um, ABAG and MTC, the Association of Bay Area Governments and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and SACOG, the Sa Sacramento um, Council of Governments in the Sacramento region. Um, so those regional and state agencies are supporting local jurisdictions in their planning efforts. And then, of course, individual applicants, whether they're individual homeowners or developers, they are also um, making project applications and doing their own planning as they present projects to cities and counties for consideration. So there's a hierarchy of planning law within this country. Um, the top of that hierarchy is the U.S. Constitution, which is the place that there actually is a statement that that the um, that we can plan for the health and welfare of our um, of our constituents. Um, federal law supports that. The California Constitution supports that as well. And then there are a series of state laws that enable local governments to have their planning laws. Um, and those local regulations, which we'll be talking about more today, include your general plan and your specific plans, as well as local zoning and other codes and ordinances. 
Those are all impacted by court decisions and what we call case law, laws that come out of court cases, as well as public opinion and public interpretation of how um, this hierarchy of, of legal, um, this legal hierarchy works. The, the ability to plan stems from what's called the police power, which does reside in the US Constitution, and the courts have ruled on this. The police power, as it's called, is the capacity of states to regulate behavior and enforce order within their territory for the betterment of the health, safety, morals, and general welfare of their inhabitants. And the courts have looked at this and said, this, this is from the Supreme Court on down, have looked at this police power, as it's called, as enshrined in the US Constitution, and have said that regulating land use and through zoning and through general plans is an activity that does lead to the betterment of the health, safety, and general welfare of inhabitants. And therefore, it's, it's allowed under the US constitutions, and it's particularly, as it's called, devolved to the states. So that's not a power that the federal government has reserved for itself. Instead, it's a power that the US, the federal government has given to the individual states. In California, that power is given further to the local governments, and it's local government who enforces local planning and makes those rules. There are three basic limitations on this police power. Um, first is that it does have to be reasonably related to public health, safety, and welfare. So um, anytime you're doing planning of any sort, you need to be sure that you really are um, do, making actions that are reasonably related to health, safety, and welfare. Um, the police power does also only apply within the geographic limits of the agency, so that means particularly within your city or within the unincorporated county where you might work, um, and it is also, it cannot be in conflict with any other general laws um, that exist elsewhere in either your codes or in state or federal law, but with those three basic limitations in place, local government in California has the power under the, the US Constitution's police power to be doing local planning, and that's been confirmed all the way up to the Supreme Court. So the planning process, I already a little bit alluded to this, um, happens though at three levels. There's regional planning, which includes state legislative requirements, the local um, MPOs or metropolitan planning organizations, such as the Southern California Association of Governments, um, you have uh, air districts throughout the state, like the South Coast Air Quality Management District or the um, Bay Area Air Quality Management District. You have, um, and those are all happening at the regional level. And then at the local level, you have two planning functions. You have long range planning, which is essentially making the rules. Um, and those rules are made through the general plan, specific plans, the zoning ordinance and other ordinances. And then in addition to the long range planning function, which is making the rules, you have the current planning function, which is enforcing the rules. This is where you receive applications and either your staff in your city or else the um, you as a sitting as the planning commission and ultimately your city council or county board of supervisors, you look at those applications and implement the zoning ordinance and general plan by ruling on those applications and approving projects that are consistent with the rules you've made. So long range planning is that local effort to make the rules. Current planning is the local effort to enforce the rules. The rules that you make um, and that exist to be enforced um, are contained in what we call the local planning framework. And you see a list here of some of the things that make up that framework. These are all things that would be adopted by either the city or the county in which you are working. And they start with the general plan, and we'll be talking about that in more detail in just a couple of minutes. The general plan is the most fundamental planning document that has all the basic rules and regulations that apply within your jurisdiction. You also have these specific plans, which you're not required to have, but which are possible under state law and which add additional specificity for an individual area than what you might find in your general plan. And then you have your zoning. And the zoning, as probably most of you know, is the detailed rules that enforce the general plan and any specific plans you have. In addition to that, you may be granting and considering conditional use permits and variances. Um, the rules for those would be called out in your zoning code, but you may be called upon to consider those. 
Um, you also will have a subdivision ordinance and you will have parcel maps that um, are the implementation of the subdivision ordinance. You have design guidelines and standards. You have the actual building permit process where after the planning process is completed, your jurisdiction gives out a building permit to actually construct a building or a set of improvements on a site. So all of these documents together, um, essentially in this order of specificity, from the most general at the top to the most specific at the bottom, these all create your local planning framework. Um, with the, all of these are supported by a series of both federal and state laws. At the federal level, we have, for example, the National Environmental Policy Act, under which we create, we prepare environmental impact statements. These are environmental review documents that explain the environmental impacts of projects that might be um, promulgated by the federal government. We also have the Federal Endangered Species Act that protects rare and endangered species, the Clean Water Act that looks at water quality, the Clean Air Act that ensures um, uh, clean air, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act that gives specific rights to development to religious institutions, um, and then finally, federal court decisions that have interpreted federal law as it regards the planning process. At the state level, we have even more um, rules because, and that makes sense because again, the, the police power has been delegated by the federal government down to the state. And so the state of California has adopted many different laws that explain how planning is done in the state. And these start with planning and zoning law, which are contained in the government code. Um, you have the Subdivision Map Act that explains how subdivisions are made and processed in this state. You have the California Environmental Quality Act, which is sort of a parallel to the National Environmental Policy Act, and that's the, docu the, the, um, the process under which environmental impact reports and mitigated neg negative declarations and initial studies are prepared. We have a separate um, element within this class about the, the CEQA and environmental review, so I won't be covering it so much now, but it is an important part of state law. In addition, state law also includes the Permit Streamlining Act that requires that jurisdictions act on development applications at a specific timing. We have the Mitigation Fee Act, which explains how jurisdictions can en enact fees to address the need for government services. We have the California Coastal Act that regulates coastal preservation along the entire California coastline. And if you're in a jurisdiction on the coast, you're probably aware that your jurisdiction has a local coastal plan or local coastal program, and those are enacted under the California Coastal Act. Um, the Ralph, Ralph M. Brown Act, also just called um, for shorthand the Brown Act, is the law under which the state of California regulates how public meetings are held. And it's very important that you follow your the Brown Act in the work you, you're doing when you have meetings. Um, there's the Political Reform Act as well. And then, of course, there are state court decisions that um, address all of those items. So um, the whole set of federal and state laws together create the overall framework in which our planning process occurs. Um, and all of these then at the local level, as I've already mentioned, are enacted um, by virtue of the fact that we use the general plan, specific plans, the zoning ordinance and other ordinances and guidelines um, to create um, the local planning framework. And we're gonna focus the rest of the time today on that local set of plan plans and processes. Uh, in theory, the planning process within your jurisdiction should be relatively straightforward. Um, the way it, it works, at least on paper, is that um, an applicant who wants to do a private project prepares an application, that application is submitted to the city or county, um, the local jurisdiction, and that local jurisdiction, whether it's a city or a county, studies it, analyzes it, um, and staff might either make a decision about it or staff would make a recommendation, and that recommendation would go to a, a commission hearing at which a planning commission would act, and then the planning commission, in some cases, would have its decision reviewed um, by the city council. Now, in fact, the process, of course, is much less linear than this. And I'm sure you've all, as planning commissioners, you've experienced this in the past. It's really often a non-linear process that begins up in the upper left-hand corner with an idea that may be something that's at the city level. It may come from a private developer or an applicant. And that idea is brought to your agency, um, your city, your county, to discuss it, to have a conversation. 
Um, as the conversation proceeds, um, there are a number of different steps involved that might include meetings and phone calls. It might include preparation of technical studies and designs and review of those technical studies and designs. And all of those pieces have to be merged with each other. And there's an iterative process by which people will make a set of decisions until finally people are comfortable enough that an applicant might submit an actual application, which can then be um, formally analyzed and reviewed. But it is important to understand that it's um, as an application is prepared, as shown on this chart, it's not simply that folks sit down and from start to finish just create a single application. There's generally a lot of technical studies, a lot of design, and a lot of meetings and calls that go into creating that overall application. So now let's switch gears and talk about the individual planning documents that you'll be using as planning commissions. And as I've already said, the most important of those is your general plan. Um, every jurisdiction, whether it's a city or a county, must have a general plan. It is required by state law. And it's what the courts have called the Constitution for Planning, Development, and Conservation in the state. And just like our US Constitution that we all, I think, know a fair amount about, the general plan is not the one place that you find every law. Just like the US Constitution does not have every federal law in it, the state constitution does not have every state law in it, um, your general plan does not have every regulation in it. The general plan is supported by other specific plans, by your zoning, by other regulations, but the general plan sets out the overall framework by which planning will occur. It provides a long range vision that's generally 20 to 30 years. It's generally updated about every 10 years, so you're on a rolling basis, and every 10 years you do a 20 to 30 year update, so you always have a picture of where you're trying to head um, over a relatively long term of 20 to 30 years, even though you've done an update every 10 year. That general plan then does become the basis for local land use decisions and other land use policies. It identifies important community issues, and it sets the ground rules by which development can occur. The general plan is required by law to have somewhere between seven and nine individual elements, as they're called. Um, these are essentially chapters. The reason that they're called elements is that state law is very clear that you can organize your general plan in any way you like. You don't have to have a chapter with every one of these titles, but you do have to be sure that every one of these elements is covered within your general plan. And there are seven of these elements, the top two rows that are required in every jurisdiction, every city, every county across the state. And then there are two others that are only required in certain jurisdictions, and those are shown down at the bottom, and I'll come to those in a minute. So first, the first seven that are required everywhere are first off land use, and the land use element is the one that sets the basic rules about how land use and development and conservation will occur within your community. There's also the housing element, which is unique among all the elements in that it's the only one that's actually certified by the state government to ensure compliance with state law. And it's also the only one that's prepared under a, a set schedule. Um, and that schedule in most jurisdictions will be once every eight years. Um, so the housing element for that reason is often a separate volume, not in the same document as the rest of your general plan, but as, a, as an element of the general plan, your housing element is an important part of the general plan itself. So we have land use, setting the land use rules. We have the housing element, talking about how your community will provide sites for the needed housing within your community. Then we have the circulation element, and the circulation element is the one that addresses not only transportation and movement of people and vehicles within your community, it also is required by law to look at, um, if you will, the circulation of, of, of services, particularly um, infrastructure such as sewer, water, and storm drainage, all must be covered either in the circulation element itself or in another element or chapter of the general plan. Beyond those three, we have the conservation element, which talks about the conservation of a variety of types of natural resources, particularly agricultural lands, mining, timber and forests, and other um, natural resource um, types of lands. And it talks about both preserving those, but also utilizing those resources. There's the open space element that talks about uh, six different types of open space that must be preserved. These include open space for the conservation of resources, 
open space for recreation, open space for tribal needs, open space to create buffers around defense inst installations. Um, those are just a few of the reasons um, that must be considered in the open space element. Obviously, conservation and open space have a lot to do with each other. And in many of your general plans, you'll find that the conservation and open space elements are combined into a single chapter or element, but it is still legally necessary to cover all of the contents that are required by state law for both of those two elements. In addition to those five I've already talked about, we have a state regulation requiring a noise element that talks about how we protect our communities from unwanted noise, noise that's too loud, and we have a safety element. And the safety element looks at various types of, of safety, public safety and um, issues that range all the way from wildfire to seismic safety, um, can look at terrorism, can look at climate change and resilience as, as the climate changes, and any number of other safety issues that you might be aware of within your own community. So those are the seven, um, land use, housing, circulation, conservation, open space, noise, and safety. Those seven are required in every jurisdiction within the state. In addition to that, state law requires an air quality element in the San Joaquin Valley, in any communities that are inside of the jurisdiction of the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. Um, air quality elements are also optional, but recommended by the state um, in other parts of the state of California, but it is required by law within the San Joaquin Valley. And then finally, we have the environmental justice element, which is an element that looks at how we have um, have a, how we have affected um, communities of, that are largely disenfranchised, lower income communities, communities of color, and we're required to document um, issues that have arisen in those communities that have to do with um, development and environmental impacts, and then finds ways to address those issues, um, looking at a variety of issues such as access to food, access to housing, and access to social services. An environmental justice element must be prepared in any community that has um, communities of concern within it, and there is a state map available to help identify where those communities are. Um, your jurisdiction, as you put together a general plan update, you need to consider whether you have those communities. If you do, you're required to have an environmental justice element. If you don't have such communities as mandated by the state, then you're not required to have an environmental justice element, although many communities are preparing environmental justice elements to address the um, poorest and most disenfranchised sectors of their communities even if they're not technically required to do that. There are many jurisdictions that feel that they wanna go the extra mile, if you will, and plan for concerns about environmental justice issues, even if they weren't required to do so by the state. So that in a nutshell, that's nine elements, all needing to be considered for your general plan, seven of them absolutely required, two of them required depending on where you're located and optional elsewhere. Um, and those nine elements, again, they can be arranged in any number of chapters that one likes, but they all need to be covered within the general plan. Um, the, the general plan can also include what are called optional elements. These are additional chapters that might cover issues that are not directly required by state law, but that your jurisdiction decides to add as well. Um, the state of California keeps a list of these optional elements that have been added by at least one jurisdiction throughout the state. There's over 100 titles of such elements, and they include things like parks and recreation, which of course has to be covered in the open space element, but some jurisdictions um, decide to have a separate parks and recreation element instead. Some jurisdictions look at sustainability in a separate element or public health. Some look at economic development, sometimes community character and urban design, and the list goes on and on. There are um, there's are elements about geothermal resources, there are elements about tribal coordination, there are elements about airports, literally over 100 separate element titles that exist in at least one general plan across the state. I would caution you not to have too many elements in your general plan. The general plan can become unwieldy, but it's certainly fine to add one or two additional optional elements if you feel that that's important in your own community. And as I said already, you may refer to these by a number of different names. You can organize them in any way you like, and you can combine the required elements in any way you like within the contents of your own general plan. General plans pretty much always include three different types of statements. Um, these are goals, policies, and actions. And you see all three of those listed here on this slide. Um, goals are statements that describe the desired future conditions, the desired end state 
um, that regarding a certain topic that's going to contribute to meeting your vision for your future. So you might, for instance, have a goal about community identity, and there's one shown here as an example. Your goal for community identity might be that neighborhoods, places, and buildings are well-maintained, demonstrate pride and reinvestment, and reinforce a sense of community. So that sets an overall goal, an overall um, outcome that you're trying to achieve. And then you have both policies and actions in your general plan to help you achieve that goal. And every one of the goals will have a series of policies and actions to help achieve it. Policies are statements that guide your decision making in your jurisdiction. So they describe a specific set of rules that you're going to enforce as you implement your general plan and your other planning um, documents. Um, it's the policies represent a way of expressing how we're going to achieve our goals, how we're going to make the vision a reality. And they're essentially rules that you set for yourself in your jurisdiction as to what you will and won't approve and the uh, kinds of actions that you will take moving forward. Now actions on the other hand, sometimes also called implementation actions or implementation measures, are the individual tasks that will allow you to achieve either a policy or a goal. So these might be uh, separate studies that you're going to do, separate actions that you will undertake. Often a general plan will change land use, the land use map in a community. And if you have changed the land use map, you may need to update your zoning code. So an example of an action in your general plan might be to complete a comprehensive update to your zoning code, which would allow you to implement some of the other policies that are within the general plan. So again, you have this hierarchy. First at the top are the goals, the statements of your desired outcomes, and then you have both policies, which are your regulations, as well as your actions that are going to help you to achieve the goals that you've put in place in the general plan. General plan, as I mentioned, has the land use element, and the land use element always includes a land use map. This is required by state law that there be a map within your general plan showing the allowed distribution of land uses within the community. This is the general plan land use map for the city of Vallejo in the northern San Francisco Bay Area. You can see that it's color coded. Um, and those colors each represent a type of use. So um, the green here is open space. Um, the light green is our resources land, sort of the olive color. And then the other colors represent urbanized uses. The buff color is the lowest density residential development. And you can see that that's the most extensive, but there are also some darker colors. The orange is a downtown or other shopping district. That's kind of the, the light orange. The darker orange are some key commercial corridors, and the darker reds are industrial and institutional areas. And, and that's true of the purple as well. So this set of color codes is kind of standard among a variety of land use practitioners. You'll often find a land use map with similar colors to these, but most importantly, the land use map is the place where you go to look to see what type of use is available and allowed in any given parcel. And then you can go to that color coded place and say that is say it's a lower density residential neighborhood. You can then look for the lower density residential regulations and understand what's allowed. Or you can look and see, oh, I'm in a, a purple area that's an industrial area. And you can go and look at the regulations about industrial uses. So the land use map gives you the key to show what's allowed where. And then you have written regulations about each of the types of uses shown on this map. General plan will also have a circulation map contained in the circulation element. This is a map that shows um, future roadways and also other types of transportation facilities. Those might include um, bikeways, pedestrian paths, and so on. And it may be shown on more than one map. But in this case, I'm showing you a map of the roadway master plan from the circulation map, again, from the Vallejo general plan. And this map um, distinguishes several different types of roadway facilities. The black lines are the actual freeways. Um, blue and red lines are state highways in the jurisdiction. Um, the orange lines are what we call arterial streets or roads. And then the green lines are collector roads, which are um, less critical than the arterials, but are more important and collect more traffic than the local streets do. So this map, um, again, typical to be found in any general plan and is the one that shows you the types of roadways and the types of roadway improvements that your community expects to be making over the life of the general plan. Uh, so we've talked now about the general plan. I mentioned also that in addition to general plans, you have specific plans um, within your jurisdiction. 
Um, specific plans are a term of art uh, under state law, and there are some relatively generalized but nonetheless present specifications for what goes into a specific plan. You will also in your community sometimes hear about other kinds of plans. Master plans, corridor plans are two names on this slide. Um, some have area plans, neighborhood plans, corridor plans. All of these types of plans, generally speaking, follow the same overall purpose and the same overall outline. They are a set of tailored land use standards to achieve a vision in a specific part of your jurisdiction. So the specific plan allows you to go into more detail than you would have gone into in the general plan and lay out more specific ways that development will occur and be implemented than you might have had in another part of the general plan. Specific plans are almost always for a smaller area of your jurisdiction than the general plan as a whole, and you might have several of them to cover various parts of the city or county. You might have one for a small village in an unincorporated county. You might have one for your downtown or for a large shopping center, um, and these specific plans for a specific part of town will include implementation, programs to achieve implementation, an infrastructure assessment, and financing. Let's go on then beyond the specific plans and talk about zoning. Um, zoning is the set of more, much more detailed regulations that implement the general plan and any specific plans that you may have. Traditional zoning is often referred to as Euclidean zoning, which is a kind of funny word. Some people think it has to do with the Greek philosopher Euclid, but it's actually not him. Um, there was this town, Euclid, Ohio, that was the test case for zoning that went before the Supreme Court in the 1920s. And um, someone sued the, the town of Euclid, Ohio, and said, you've just passed a zoning code. That's illegal. We don't think you're allowed to regulate land use. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, you do have the ability to regulate land use. That flows from the police power. It is devolved by the federal government to the state. The states devolve it further to the local government, and local government does indeed have the ability to regulate land uses through their zoning. So that traditional form of zoning, Euclidean zoning, is based on an identification and separation of uses. And remember, we go back to that period around the turn of the 19th to 20th centuries in which there were very squalid conditions in many parts of our, of our nation. And there was a desire to separate uses, particularly industry, to be separated away from housing so that people living in their houses wouldn't be subjected to problems um, from um, industry or other non-residential uses. So that's where this idea of a separation of uses emerges. And Euclidean zoning focuses, therefore, on uses, on the intensity of those uses, on the setbacks between uses and the setbacks from of, of individual buildings from the roadways, but with much less emphasis on building form or the nature of the community that we're creating. Um, and this was so this was very important as a step in creating better communities in the in the US to be able to separate those uses and identify the ways that uses would be managed. But they didn't always result in really beautiful communities or an emphasis on building form. Because of that, starting in the 1980s and 90s, we saw um, additional zoning come forward um, that looks at um, what's called form-based zoning. And you see that here, um, zoning that is based on building form and design, focusing on issues like design and mass, building scale, type and context, the relationship of buildings to public space, and the design of streets in the public realm. On this slide, you see a, an example of a page out of a form-based zoning code. And you can see that it's pretty heavily illustrated. It has photos and diagrams to help people understand exactly the type of physical form that we're looking for. So this is a type of zoning that um, looks at building form, building frontages, building types, the design of roadways, public spaces, and architectural detail much more than you would find in traditional or Euclidean zoning. But in either case, whether you're looking at a traditional zoning code or a form-based zoning code, you're going to be looking at um, being consistent with your general plan and being able to control both the uses, building size, landscaping, signs, billboards, parking requirements, and so forth. And in most cases, Today, you will find that your zoning code probably has both some traditional or Euclidean components and probably also has some form-based components. Those often now coexist 
in a single zoning code, and you'll find them both both parts of both types of zoning um, within your local zoning code. And then, of course, there are a number of other tools that you might be using, and I'm going to be talking about a few of those now um, as we go through these next set of slides. Um, design standards and guidelines, subdivision regulations, um, conditional use permits, development permits, overlays, and variances. I'm not going to touch on all of these, but most of them. Um, the first one to talk about are um, design standards and design guidelines. And these are um, standards and guidelines that are put together to control the physical design of development within your community. Um, there's been a great deal of work on this subject recently under state law over the last 10 years or so. Communities used to have quite a bit of leeway in developing both advisory design guidelines that are negotiable, but also objective design standards that would not be negotiable and give objective guidance that must be implemented. Uh, state law has recently been amended to say that there, are, um, in most cases, you cannot enforce negotiable or subjective design guidelines on residential projects. You can have objective design standards um, as long as they are truly objective and they can be implemented at the staff level without any subjective um, analysis or without any subjective rule um, interpretation by a board or staff. So um, you do still see design guideline documents um, within a community and particularly for non-residential units uh, uses. You see design standards um, for both residential and non-residential uses. And in both cases, these are documents that show the look and feel of the type of land use design that's desired and can be reviewed by a developer before an application is put together. Um, it's very important to write all those rules down to make sure that they are clear and objective. Um, and generally, these rules will be paying most of most attention at the edges of a development. That is the place where it meets the street, the pay, place where it's publicly visible, and the place where it butts up against surrounding uses. Um, there are. Uh, we also do want to talk about um, some of the distinctions that occur within your zoning code. Um, you will see, as we mentioned, you'll see that land use uh, land use types can be divided into a series of zoning districts. And we already talked about with the general plan land use map, your zoning code will also have a zoning map that divides your jurisdiction into individual district. And within each of these districts, any individual use might be either what we call ministerial or discretionary. A ministerial land use is one that's permitted automatically. That is, if it's on the list of ministerially permitted or sometimes called by right permitted uses within your community, then a person can say, oh, that's on the list. It says here, for example, this is the single family residential district. I can build a single family home and I know that that's allowed. Nobody has to tell me if it's going to be allowed or not. I can just do it because it's listed as a by right or ministerial use within this district. Conversely, a discretionary use may or may not be permitted depending on findings that are made within the jurisdiction. So there may be a series of, of um, rules about each of these discretionary uses, a series of findings that you might need to make as planning commissioners. And if you can make those findings, if you, for instance, find that it won't make too much noise, it won't emit too much light, it won't create too much traffic, it won't create other disturbances, you have this list of conditions under which you can uh, approve a, 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 such a use. And then if you find as the planning commission that you that your the proposal does meet that set of criteria, then you can give it a discretionary permit. This would be an item that can either be looked at by staff for that discretionary review, or it comes to you as planning commissioners for your discretionary review of, the, of that proposal. So that's um, pretty much nearing the end of my presentation regarding the planning framework. I want to wrap up with a few tips for you as you're working to do review of the projects. Um, as I've said, some projects will be reviewed simply by your staff, particularly those that are ministerial. Sometimes even discretionary permits will be reviewed by your staff, but most discretionary permits will come to you as planning commissioners. And these are some tips to follow as you look at those applications and go to pass judgment on them. The first and perhaps most important is to work really con con um, um, co cooperatively with your staff members 
um, and let them help you. Your city or county are paying your staff to uh, assist you, to make recommendations to you, to do staff reports, to analyze projects, and to make preliminary findings for you. So do follow what your staff says, pay attention to them. Um, they are only making recommendations and it's up to you to decide whether to accept the, the recommendations they make, but please do pay careful attention to what they're saying. At the same time, it's important to understand that experts aren't right all the time. You may find that you disagree with your staff. You may also find um, that a, an applicant submits a report and says, this is how we think things are gonna go. You or your staff may not agree with that. You may find that there are, several experts in a field, say several traffic engineers, several biologists looking at endangered species, they might have differing opinions. So in the end, it is going to be up to you to look at the work that your experts, including your staff, but other outside experts as well, look at all the work they do and you make the decision about what you think is right. At the same time, also remember that not all opponents are wrong. It may be people may come up to a hearing about a project, opposing it. You may feel like this is a good project and you want to you wanna support that project, or you may think it's a terrible project and you're planning to um, vote against it, but do be open-minded, do listen to all sides, and remember that even if folks disagree with each other or disagree with you, they're not always wrong about everything, and it's important to understand their point of view and important to um, work with them and take into account everything they're saying. And in that regard, of course, don't be afraid to change your mind. You should come into a hearing um, with an open mind. You should come in without having created a preconceived notion. You should listen to all sides. And even if you thought a certain thing, a yes or a no about a project when you came into a meeting, don't be afraid to change your mind. Listen to all the sides and do um, form your opinion as you hear the cases and decide what you think is the best way to do. Um, so with that in mind, it's also important to um, always articulate what it is that you're looking for. You can't expect folks to read your mind. You can't expect that people are reading, uh, that you're reading others' minds. Um, so tell staff and tell applicants what it is you want to see and how you can move the project forward to get to the thing that you want. And while you're there in the in a hearing or as you as you research about a project, feel free to ask questions. Be sure and get all the questions you have answered and make sure you really understand um, what's going on. And at the same time, understand that you may not have perfect information. Um, in planning, we often do have to make decisions as to whether to move a project forward or not, even though we have imperfect or incomplete information. So while you do need to ask questions, and make sure that you have all the information um, that's available to you, you may sometimes find that some information just isn't available and you're still going to have to move a project forward. So hopefully these tips will give you a sense of how to work as a planning commissioner, both as you um, look at the adoption of a general plan or a general plan amendment or a new zoning code or a specific plan, doing that advanced planning task, and also as you review individual project applications doing your current planning task. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I do wanna wrap up just with some housekeeping that you may have seen in other sessions as well. I wanna remind you that almost all of the information um, from these lectures that are available online is also available in the digital toolkit for planning commissioner planning commissioners that's called the planning commissioner handbook um, it's available at ilgplanninghandbook.org that's written here at the bottom of the slide and that has updated content in addition to these online lectures the the book itself has updated content about um, CEQA community engagement legal issues in planning housing laws financing and so much more so please do go online and take a look at that online resource that's really a compendium and, and, a, and a, a, is a good complement to the online lectures that we're preparing and, and giving you through these sessions. I also wanna point out that there are many other additional resources available to you. Um, the Institute for Local Governments also publishes the ILG Housing Toolkit available at ilghousingtoolkit.org. Um, there is a statewide housing plan available on the state website. Um, the um, uh, housing, uh, State Department of Housing and Community Development um, has its housing planning hub site, um, and you see that um, email website address here, and there's also a housing element video available for you to view to understand more about housing element law.
And then there's lots of other resources as well. As well. Um, I'll put in a plug, it's not on this list, but I did mention that I've written a book um, that's available through Solano Press on the preparation of general plans. Solano Press is a private company that has many other excellent books about CEQA, housing law, planning law in general, and other um, important information. So you can check them out. In addition, you can check out the California Office of Planning and Research, who promulgates the general plan guidelines, um, the California Environmental Quality Act, which is also on the um, Office of Planning and Research website, um, environmental court decisions that are available online, um, and information available from the League of Cities um, and the State Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, the upper right um, Cal Enviro screen reference here is a reference that I mentioned when talking about the environmental justice element. This is the place where you can go and look online to find out if your community has any of those communities of concern that are required to have prepared for them an environmental justice element. That's Cal Enviro screen. So these are all resources that hopefully will be of use to you as well. So with that said, um, I'm going to wrap up here. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you in others of these sessions. And I hope you'll be able to avail yourselves of the many um, online and written documents I've talked about as well. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye.